Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld adventure in the tropical rainforest with the believers of Boyo. Last time we left off after making some good progress on our small mountain base, we also had to fight off our first infestation and we had Brandon return from his excursion with the Empire, and today we are eagerly awaiting the birthday of Ellie, as our colony's youngest is about to age up to a small child. Now, to get things started, Randy sends a mad monkey our way, but as you can imagine, a monkey is no match for Wyatt, who swiftly kills the rabbit animal with one strike from his plasma sword Redhawk. Afterwards, we can then watch as Grizzly Bear Cobalt immediately starts to feast on it, and so begins a new day in the jungle. Now, at this point, it's time to talk about research, and after reading all of your comments on the last episode, it seems to me like with electricity now unlocked, most of you were in favor of now unlocking water milk generators, which strikes me as a smart idea, considering that it would allow us to generate a steady supply of a good amount of power, and that the project here would be completed much, much faster than geothermal power, for example. So, water mill generators, that might just be our power source for the foreseeable future, but it might not be the only one, as we can see Squigs here currently attempting to tame a boomalope. No, that is something we have not yet done in any of our playthroughs, and as you can see, it does also succeed on the first attempt, which means we can now give out another name from the list of patron supporters in the naming rights tier and above, and this time the name that was randomly selected is Krilly, so congratulations and welcome to the colony of Rat Chapel. Now, as you probably already know, boomalopes can be milked for chem fuel, 11 units of it every single day, and in doing so, they are actually much more efficient than, let's say, a biofuel refinery, and that chem fuel itself can then be used for various things, first and foremost, of course, also to generate power, but also to fuel pod launchers or to make mortar shells, all of which things that we might want to do sooner or later. Now, the big downside of boomalopes is that they explode when they die, so our next task here is to secure our animal pen a bit more. We still want the boomalopes to be able to graze outside, that way they will basically be generating chem fuel for free, but we do not want them to be attacked by raiders, pirates or wild animals, which is why we are currently replacing our wooden pen fence with a sturdy granite wall. As you can see in the bottom right, Wyatt is also currently carving out a small indoors area for our animals. However, he does not quite get to finish it before going on an ambrosia binge. Hardly surprising, considering that we still have a high-intensity psychic drone going on. The real surprise is actually that he is the one to break first, while the psychically sensitive Light and Brandon both remain steadfast. And in a somewhat ironic twist, the psychic sooth then also comes to an end just a few seconds later. Unfortunate, but it always could have been worse. In the evening then, we can see Took quickly rearranging some beds. Thank you guys for pointing out in the comments that some of the end tables were not properly attached. Meanwhile, our new exterior wall is coming along, albeit rather slowly, it is still granite after all that we are working with. On the following morning then, we can see Squigs venture out to tame another boomalope, of course we can't just have the one. We already have a female, now we want a male, and she did already fail her taming attempt once on the day before. This time, however, as you can see, she succeeds, and with that, we now welcome Boomalope Seth to the colony, once again chosen from the list of patron supporters in the naming rights tier and above. Now producing 22 units of chem fuel per day, we could actually sustain about 5 chem fuel generators with these two, which would result in a steady power output of 5000 watts, but perhaps it would be best not to rely on that too early, at least not until our animal pen is properly secured. Our small animal shelter, meanwhile, is finished now, and so we are moving in the beds, while our common room is now also finally receiving its last touches. As you can see, we have a few more things planned for construction, but those will have to wait until the next morning. Very early on that next morning, then an eclipse hits the jungle. As you might remember, we are also still in a volcanic winter, so crop production might just be slowed down a tiny little bit. So instead of crops, let us produce furniture. Brandon is currently putting up three wooden blackboards surrounding a school desk. This is one of the ways that Ellie can learn new skills as a child. The school desk alone will already give her that option, but the blackboards increase her learning speed 20% for each of them, up to a maximum of three. We can also see here that apparently it has not taken our boomalopes long to get comfortable with each other. In the meantime, our small classroom area has been finished, as our colonists are slowly getting ready to wrap up their days. 
We can also see here that the entire area is already deemed extremely impressive, which is actually why I decided against building a separate classroom. I think it just makes sense to reap the benefits of one large beautiful area, especially underneath a mountain it can be rather tedious to beautify plenty of smaller spaces, which is actually why I had briefly thought about having all of our colonists sleep inside of a large barracks, which I think would actually fit quite well with the repenting theme we have going on. So let me know if that's something you'd be interested in seeing. We could definitely connect all of our small bedrooms here. First of all though, we are informed of what I believe is already the third Ambrosia sprout of this series. Although, just like the previous two, I don't think we will see this one come to fruition either. While the first two merely burned, this one here will likely die soon as a result of standing next to the architect structure. And so, let's not pay it any further attention. Instead, we can watch as the last bit of the common room is now also being mined out. And then, shortly after the eclipse has come to an end, we are now moving all of our ideology stuff in here too. Just so we no longer have to hold our rituals outside. In the evening then, we can watch as Light finishes a marble small sculpture. A sculpture that is very aptly named Light's Eyes. It depicts Light fighting off five singers attacking his caravan. A somewhat exaggerated reference to the caravan ambush we had a few episodes ago. Either way, I think this one just has to go inside of Light's bedroom. And yes, despite Light being blind, he will still benefit from the beauty bonus it provides. On the following morning then, events from the start of the episode repeat themselves. Once again, a local monkey goes mad. And also once again, Wyatt quickly takes care of business without suffering so much as a scratch. In our common room meanwhile, we light things up with beautiful dark light braziers. They are simply a bit more wood efficient than their regular counterparts. Although I have to admit, I also quite like their aesthetic. Now at this point we should also talk about this quest right here, the Imperial Waste Pack Dump, which I have decided we will not pursue any further. Yes, a new Eltex rope for light would certainly be useful, but there is a fine line between being charitable and letting others exploit us, and this quest here felt much more like the latter. So instead we start digging again, a tunnel away from our prison, a tunnel that will actually give us access to the underground river. And as you can imagine, that river will be of use to us very soon, as I think it makes for the perfect spot to build our first water mill generator. Before we get started on that, however, it is finally time. It is Ellie's birthday. As you can see, Ellie has now grown up and become a child, and that now offers a whole new realm of possibilities. As you can see, Ellie can now do a variety of new tasks, and we could actually also make the choice to enslave her now, which we are obviously not going to do. Ellie will remain a traps person just like the rest of our colonists. Now, interestingly enough, apart from the new tasks listed here, Ellie can now actually also start learning psychasts, and considering that we still have a silent neuroformer lying around, that might be something worth doing. However, we also have Brandon with the psychically sensitive trait, who might therefore be the better candidate, but again, let me know who you think we should give this to. In the meantime, let's talk a bit about learning, because that is what Ellie is hopefully going to do for most of her time. The Biotech DLC offers various so-called learning activities, but similar to how our colonists use recreation, we can't force Ellie to use one specific type over another. Instead, we have to provide her with means for all of them. The more she learns, the higher her growth tier will become, and the higher that growth tier, the more we can influence what kind of person she eventually becomes. It's a bit like in The Sims, which was actually one of the first games I ever played on this channel. So the more we fulfill the needs of our children, the broader the selection of good stuff we can eventually select for them. Now, as a child, Ellie will of course also get her very own bedroom. Although, again, plans might still change, and we might transform this entire area into a barracks down the line. For now at least, Ellie's birthday is celebrated, not with a party, but with a psychic sooth. A psychic sooth that affects all males, and should therefore have quite the positive effect on the majority of our colonists. Shortly after then, Kevin finishes researching the water mill generator, and so in just a moment we will build ourselves our very first power source. A power source that we are going to need, because up next is Xenogenetics. I think, since this is going to be the channel's dedicated biotech playthrough, it makes sense to jump into this right away. With a child now in the colony, our people might be itching for more, and they might no longer be content with only seeing the youngest improve. A big part of their redemption arc might very well be the desire to become the best versions of themselves possible, and who's to say that that does not extend to the genetic level. It will be some time until we can actually start working on that, so for now let's plop down our first water mill generator. You can see it in the list of materials, it does not come cheap, but our mind is quickly taken off of that as Brandon creates a pair of masterwork kit pants, because of course we do not want Ellie to run around naked all the time, not only for the sake of decency, but also for protection. 
So just as Brandon finishes her outfit, the Royal Tribute Collector passes by, but in the absence of slaves and gold, we don't really have much to give them. And so we can jump back to Ellie, now decked out in elephant leather gear, and also with a shield belt, just to be safe, you never know what the youngest might get themselves into. Later that day, then, we can also watch the first bit of learning taking place as Wyatt teaches Ellie about the social skill. Admittedly, not really his area of expertise, but this does actually improve his own social skill too, but that is regardless of the skill he is teaching, which is once again also randomly selected. For the remainder of the day, then, not much more happens, and so we already jump ahead to the next morning, where Squeaks can be seen teaching Ellie the shooting skill, while Brandon finally starts construction of the watermill generator. As you can see, once the materials are assembled, the building is quickly put up, and so, a short moment later, we have our first source of power, a steady output of 1100 watts, which might not be a huge amount, but it should keep us going for the foreseeable future. And so, with the secrets of electricity unlocked, we are first of all replacing our hand tailoring bench with an electric one. The increase in crafting speed here is just too good to pass up. And while we're mining a bit more steel to construct it, we can see Brandon once again making moves on Squigs. As you can see, he seems to really like her, although that is unfortunately not really true the other way around. But who knows, the two of them might still get there. Eventually then, everything is in place, and Brandon starts tailoring a cowboy hat, just as we have a lone visitor appear on the edge of the map, and as you can see, they do have something to trade. The cowboy hat, meanwhile, that was for Ellie, just to get her temperature resistance up a bit further, and also because she just looks fabulous in it. In the evening then, we continue fortifying our pen, and the lone trader has also finally made it over to us. Unfortunately though, apart from a bit of herbal medicine, there's not much here, so we're just dumping a few things, but otherwise the trade remains uneventful. On the next morning then, you can see it, more pen progression, and we are now also replacing our wood fuel stove with an electric one, not for productivity reasons, but simply because it does consume a lot of wood, and I would like to reduce the amount of time that our farmers spend chopping trees. For defensive purposes, we are then also finally installing that mortar we obtained outside of the base, so even without having it researched, we can now use it. Of course, only with the handful of mortar shells we already have, acquiring more of them could be a bit difficult. Or perhaps easier than I thought, albeit for rather unfortunate reasons, as our colony of Red Chapel is once again getting besieged. At first glance, it doesn't look like much, but there's 23 enemies here, who are now setting up their mortar camp in the northeastern edge of the map, giving us the perfect opportunity for a preemptive strike. Let's see if the shell here can find its target. Alright, it goes long, unfortunately, although luckily our second shell is a bit more accurate. Still, unfortunately, it landed in a spot where it only injured a single enemy, and so we now do what we usually do in these situations, jump in with Psycaster Light to cause chaos in the enemy ranks. Once the Berserk Pulse has been triggered, a light quickly skips back out, and as you can see, our enemies have also already given up their position. They are now coming for our base, or at least those of them that remain. Just in that moment, we also receive another slightly more amicable quest from the Empire. The rewards here are all pretty good, I have to say, and all we would need to do in exchange is to accept a few days of electrical downtime until we can then clear out a site guarded by only four mechanoids, which should hopefully be doable with the right setup. Speaking of setup though, for the moment, finding the right one against our enemies is our top priority. As you can see, we are hunkering down inside of the mountain here, and at least to get us started, we are using the skip psychast to skip a few unfortunate enemies into melee range for Wyatt. But I have to say, this fight could not have come at a more unfortunate moment in time. We were just in the process of walling off our entire pen plantation area, and instead of succeeding at that, it is now swarming with enemies. Now, on the bright side, at least for the moment, those enemies are not harming our animals, probably also because the bears and the Earl of Bronze are hidden inside of the mountain with us, while Wyatt is just absolutely decimating one enemy after another. And as you can see, we are actually doing a very fine job of luring them deeper and deeper into the mountain. Still, I will be the first to admit that this fight is a bit of a mess. With proper defenses, I think we could have solved this much more nicely. Unfortunately though, our enemies arrived just before we got those constructed. At the very least then, this kill here sends them packing, and everyone but Wyatt is completely healthy afterwards. And because we are charitable, we will also let everyone flee who still can. The one person who does not meanwhile is being captured, while the rest of our colonists beat out the fire. 
Our prisoner, meanwhile, is most likely going to survive, despite having an eye stabbed out by Wyatt, and having her survive would be a great thing, as she is a genie with a good skill setup, not only passionate about arts, intellectual and crafting work, but also with a knack for animals and shooting things. She is a delicate wimp with the tortured artist and annoying voice traits, however, so she might not be the easiest one to work with. With the fires almost beaten out, the psychic sooth then also comes to an end, and we can jump back to our prisoner once more, because I think I have come up with a good prisoner protocol for the believers of Boyo. Now, first things first, we're going to take care of the injuries, after all, we are charitable like that, and then we will make it a priority to convert them, as I imagine that would be the first step in seeing the errors of their ways. Once conversion has been successful, we are then going to enslave them, and after a yet-to-be-determined amount of time has passed and our prisoner has proven themselves useful, we will then make the choice to either add them to our colony permanently or to simply let them go. Now, admittedly, the letting them go part might very well also come in the form of selling them to the Empire. I think all of that will depend quite heavily on how well they behave. For now, at least, that is the idea. Let me know how you feel about it and whether or not you think it suits our colony. And one thing I almost forgot to do, our prisoner will of course also be stripped, as this allows us to recover an untainted marine armor and marine helmet, and those are always going to be useful. A short while later, Grizzly Bear Jen then unfortunately comes down with the flu, but as you can see, Light is quick on the scene and should prevent this from doing any harm. The remainder of the afternoon is spent with cleanup, and so we rejoin our colonists in the evening, where we are informed that, thankfully, most of the ash has settled, and that means the volcanic winter is coming to an end. Still, it's not all great around the colony of Red Chapel, as Took suffers food poisoning, a rare occasion caused by himself, and one that will most likely spread to a few more colonists as the day progresses, because, and I think you know this already, if you're making meals in batches, then the food poisoning chance is applied to the entire batch, so we probably have a few more bad meals in our stockpile. What we also have is a local chinchilla going mad, just as Quick suffers food poisoning, but thankfully, at least in the chinchilla's case, there is a quick solution, and it goes by the name of Wyatt. This time, our swordsman does take a few bruises himself, but again, that's nothing that Kevin can't fix. And so the day continues, first with food poisoning for Brandon, and then with Kevin's first prisoner conversion attempt. As a tortured artist, she does lose certainty quite quickly. In this case, one single attempt loses her about 30% of it. Oh, and Light has also gotten food poisoning now. Although in his case, the consequences are a bit more severe, his consciousness level is never really the highest to begin with, and he is also still under the influence of a word of joy psychast, and so he collapses pretty much immediately. Once he has been carried off to bed, then it's time for another ritual, a conversion ritual as we want to give our prisoner a proper introduction to the believers of Boyo, not to mention that we also have a good chance here of obtaining at least one more ideology development point. And indeed we do, as the conversion ritual is deemed effective, not quite enough for the full conversion, but good enough for a plus three mood bonus, as well as for ideology development point number seven. At this point then, it's also high time that we accept the EMI Dynamo quest, and we'll do so for the double Altex gear at the top here, as you can see the Altex robe is actually a masterwork. That strikes me a bit more useful compared to two side trainers and some uranium, although primarily because I do not consider those two side trainers to be the most useful. In any case, the EMI machine activates immediately. Jumping to its location, we can see that it's about one day of travel away from our base, although unfortunately at the moment I don't think that we are in any shape to attack it. Still, the reward is arriving immediately, and so we will now be hauling two fresh new pieces of Altex gear into the base. This should keep Light happy and effective for a little while longer. Just in that moment, we are then also informed that Boomalope Krilly has already given birth, and so our latest animal offspring will now go by the name of 00000661. Yep, that's the joy of randomly selecting these. Sometimes you have some rather unique ones pop up. In the early evening then, it is finally time our prisoner has been successfully converted, and that means it's time for the next step in the Believers of Boyo prisoner program. At this point, our next target is to enslave them, which should hopefully not take too long. All we need to do here is to break their will, not their resistance, so I expect this will not take more than just a few days. The following day then begins with good news and bad news. The good news, our prisoner has made a full recovery. The bats, Took is being hunted by three rhinos, and we don't have any psychasters close by to help him out. Light is still unconscious, and Wyatt does not have enough psi focus to cast the skip psychast. He is very close though, so I have scheduled him for some emergency meditation. 
Still, unfortunately, it's not quite enough, as the rhinos reach took well before we can do anything about it. And so our hunter and cook goes down after just a few swift blows. Thankfully, though, it's nothing lethal. Outside of our base, then, the rhinos meet the full force of our animals, and together with our bears and the Earl of Bronze, we are capable of taking them down. This was a needlessly close call, though, so it's probably for the best if we are a bit more careful with Took in the future. On the bright side, we now have plenty of meat, as well as a closed-off pen, and Took's injuries are also quickly tended to. And so, all in all, I have to say, this definitely could have gone worse. Took is then also quickly back on the scene, butchering one of the rhinos, while you can see Kevin make good progress with our prisoner, not to mention the three-year-old Ellie carrying an entire rhino by herself, looks to me like she has learned a few very useful skills already. A short while later then, we are the recipients of yet another quest, and once again I promise I did not influence this in any way, but we are being asked here to rescue none other than Maniac, and this would be THE Maniac from our last series, and to be perfectly honest, I'm not quite sure how I feel about this. Of course, from a role-playing standpoint, the believers of Boyu would probably be all over this quest, and it doesn't seem to be too difficult to me. But the plan for this series was of course to feature new faces and to not just recycle the old ones. So once again, I would be very interested to hear what you think about this. Should we go and rescue Maniac and reintroduce him to his former colony members? Or should we perhaps just let him be? All of that and more will then be decided in the next episode, an episode that will most likely begin with us trying to take down that EMI field. At the moment it's not too annoying, but I had to go back to the old fuel stove, but the effects will of course become more and more noticeable as time progresses. So for today then, let's wrap things up as always with some fan art, starting with a lovely piece by Lavi Was Taken, this one featuring some of those nasty insects we had to fight last episode, as well as one of our colonists, I believe this might be light with a smoke launcher, but I have to admit I'm not entirely sure. Definitely featuring light is then this piece by Isaac Young, who in his email speculates a bit more about light's psychological profile. It's a bit too long to read it all out here, but I'll copy and paste it in a comment down below. It definitely paints an interesting picture of who light might be. And finally, we have ourselves a lovely rendition of the Earl of Bronze by Michelle Jones. This one definitely reminds me a bit of that Fatty McCool poster. Either way, a great depiction of one of our colony's most important members. And with that, we have now reached the end of today's episode, so let's make the cut right here. As always, I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.